Jekina Nai Nenyanya, Warabi Na Nada Bandara Nai, Nakana Nana Warandri Wawarung, Jiri Kangwano Jiri Bororo. I stand here speaking from my heart. I recognize the Wurundjeri and the Wawarung people and acknowledge their unceded lands that we're meeting on today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to just thank um, the organizers of this event for inviting me to speak today. Um, I represent, I'm a Deuteroa descendant, so that's what I, I'm coming to today as. And recently, um, I've spent a lot of time on country up in the northeast and got to know it really well, and that's where I met Cam Walker, who's invited me to come today. And hearing all of these conversations, um, they're all things that we know. They're all things we have to know as Indigenous people. And we kind of have to be experts on everything that's related to country. So it's a pretty hard task. Uh, these are the three nations that make up um, our recent native title claim. So I'm here because we're an unrecognised organisation. Um, in, in Victoria, I don't know if people here know that there's 38 nations, um, Aboriginal nations in Victoria. I see a few nods, that's great. Um, but there's only 11 formally recognised in Victoria. And on a federal level for the native title, there's only six in Victoria that are currently recognised. And that's over a period of 30 years that native title has been going. So it shows you how complicated it is and how our voices are not heard in places where they should be, um, and especially at government um, tables. So on the weekend, we, last weekend, we held our um, collective native title um, authorization meeting for these three mobs here, so the Deuteroa, Waveru, and Nagara Ilam. This um, slide is just some images from the amount of people that we had there. So it was an extremely professionally organised event where we um, engaged. We, we had to have it on, on, we couldn't have it on country because too many people don't live on country. We um, were so broadly dispersed and our culture is so um, decimated that people just don't live on country. It's, it's quite astounding to think that that's the case, but it is the case. Um, as I said, I've spent a lot of time on country this year because I'm trying to look at how we can get our people back on country, and that's a primary concern that me and my elders and my people have. So at our um, native title meeting, um, people may have heard stories about those meetings, but they can be pretty robust, <laughs> to say the least. Um, th with three different nations trying to come together to um, to do that, it was it was unprecedented because we were able to pass every single motion without any fighting. It was amazing, you know. We we moved forward in um, such style and such professional um, activities, and I think part of the reason for that was we were able to have a whole weekend where we delivered some information about what's on country. What are some of the, the threats, like the, the, the um, uh, introduced species that we just heard about? Um, that was a big uh, part of our conversation on the weekend. So people went into our authorisation meeting really well informed and were able to make those votes and make those counts. So that, that's being lodged um, shortly. Um, when we're talking about fragmented, fra fragmented um, history and culture, uh, and that certainly is the case. But I just wanted to share very briefly. So in, in terms of everybody always wants to know, uh, like indigeneity is really sexy and it's really interesting and people want to know everything. They want to know all the stories. What's your creation story? What's your dreaming story? Where are your song lines? Um, and I wish I knew them all. I don't. Um, but some, some oral history, like my mother, um, she died in 1998, so she was just in the 90s where um, people were beginning to be a little bit more confident to talk about their indigeneity and that's when she started to. At that time I lived overseas so it was only when I spoke to her on the phone and you know it was old style phone on the wall, um, cost a lot of money so it was you know fairly, fairly infrequent um, those conversations but she started to share some of her, her stories about her culture you know and um, 
and, and she didn't have the language, she didn't have the right um, connection rights, I suppose, and, 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 and the terminology. So she talked about my great-grandmother being a, a tribal princess. And when, when I was a young kid, she had said, you know, your great-grandmother was a princess. And as a young kid, you kind of think, you know, it's all very romantic and everything. And then in the 90s, when she had that confidence to speak out a little bit more, she added the word tribal. And that had a different connotation. And coming, and she died shortly, you know, like in late November uh, 1998. So when I came back to Australia to live permanently in 2001, after being out of the country for more than 20 years, and finished raising my children and everything in 2015, I started um, to be employed by an ind Indigenous organisation in Bundaberg. And for me, that was like coming home. Earlier this year, um, in January, I went on a CHMP work with that was hosted by Parks Victoria. And for me, going on that country, that was home. And every time I go on that country now, it talks to me and I, I feel completely different. So that's the importance of country to our people. Um, this is the claim area for our native title. Sorry, I was going to read a story. <laughs> Let's go back to that. So Biami is the spirit creator. Perhaps this isn't the name in our language, but we've borrowed it. So Biami, the great creator, sent an old woman, Kon Kawandikba, and a giant serpent, Mari Diju, which means big snake, um, from the high country. The old lady carried with her a big stick, a Malala Diju, which is a woman's yam stick. Um, they're used for, for digging, but this was a giant one. So as she wove her way through the mountains, she used her stick to carve the riverbeds and the, st and streams, uh, the stream channels. And the giant serpent followed, smoothing the passages and filling these with water. So this is a, an oral history that I've um, been told by my elders. And it's got, it's got the basis of this really incredible story, but we need to fill it with the details. So every time we go back on country, we start to see something, start to feel something. So you saw the country um, there. This is a um, CHMP work. So... For those of you that may not know what that is, cultural heritage management plan that has to be done before any kind of developments or changes. So this was to do with Parks Victoria um, wanting to upgrade the tracks, the walking tracks and so forth. So um, because, we, because there is no formal recognition in that area, all interested parties are invited to come along. So in this particular... Um, activity it was three weeks so we spent uh, a lot of time walking up some seriously steep inclines and declines not great for old knees and um, we camped on the mountain and I realized that in my 20s I had spent time up there um, skiing and didn't know it was my country but here I was and it was my country so you can see there um, on the left so that is um this is one of our traditional owners who's a healer who is connecting to country there and all throughout that experience was connecting to a lot of the plants and so forth that just would kind of jump out at her. You can see on the second one that's a, a yam daisy. So we were just identifying the difference between the regular daisies, the introduced daisies and um, the yam daisy. Um, the, the the photo to the left is I had a GoPro on and I was filming that as I walked. And it was a fairly narrow track and sometimes it would disappear and there'd just be rock and you'd think, how, how am I going to get out of here? <laughs> so all of, all of that experience with all of those people, our people that were there, but there was not only us and just our component alone. So we had four four people each week um, representing our communities. And that cost around $150,000. So that was money that was spent by the department. And then there were six other groups 
that had either two or four members. So that's how much money was wasted by the department when it could have been used to assist us to get people back on country. Because this is what we really need, is people back on country so that we can spend time. I mean, what happened during that, that activity was people had to take leave from their jobs. So maybe they had cultural leave, maybe they didn't. Maybe they had annual leave, maybe they didn't. Maybe they just had to take leave without pay. When you go up there, there's a whole bunch of things that you need when you go on country. So in order to be um, safe, you've got to have things like your snake gaiters. So, you know, that's 100 bucks. Then there's your walking boots. It's another 400 bucks. Um, or your camping equipment or your, your packs, all of that. It costs a lot of money. So any money that our people got paid went to providing all of those things. And the reason I'm telling you these things is because these are the realities for our people, getting our people in country. And we manage to be such a professional organisation, even though we're not formally recognised, we have no income to say there is no revenue apart from um, these kinds of works, which we are, are grateful for, but we want more. We want a seat at the table. The things that are important in the forest are, as you can see, there's a bunch of um, scar trees there. So identifying those, uh, those were really close to some very public walking paths. And, and they, they hadn't been registered or marked or noticed before. So we're up there and we're having a look and that's why it's important for, for us to be on country because even with... You know, some of us, like myself, I have very limited knowledge about forests. In fact, I know nothing about them. I know nothing about how to find scar trees other than what I've learnt this year. But we had a lot of uh, other people that were very experienced, had been brought up on country and had that continuing connection to country where they know how to identify these things. Um, the different types of culturally modified trees, you know, your scar trees, so for your, your canoes, for your um, shields, for your um, coolamans, um, and other carrying vessels, that's what they're used for. Um, the ring trees, which um, are culturally modified to identify specific elements in the country that you know then how to read country um, in connection with the stars and with um, other, other aspects of the environment. So those are some of the important um, things that are on country that we need to do, and, and I'm sure that... Um, I think Dave Wandham spoke yesterday and he would have talked a lot about the cultural things. You know, we have similar uh, aspirations and similar um, needs to get people in country to do all this this work, that you know, with the forest, with managing forests. And we do have people in positions who know how to, uh, who, who are forest workers, like they do know how to, um, handle the forest, they do know how to look at the the clearing, the um, all, all of the different aspects that you re are required to keep the forest safe. Um, up in this country, of course, there's the um, all the trees that the the ash uh, trees that are dead and standing there. They look amazing when you take photos absolutely gorgeous but they're in danger of collapsing you know and there's it requires um i think the figure is three three million dollars a year to keep that seeding process going and that has ended i think in june 2023 this year so if we don't get more funding to be able to do that then if there is another bushfire um that can maim those ones that are growing because it takes like 20 years for those seeds to be ready to to um, start to self-sow. Um, it takes 20 years. So we haven't got that with those. So we have to have this, this seeding program in place. And these are all parts of the work that we as traditional owners want to be engaged with on country. We want to be there at the table um, from the planning 
stages. We don't want to be brought in afterwards or engaged as cultural heritage site workers. We want to be part of that planning. We want to know all of that. So um, those things are important. This is, again, I'm just showing the, um, the native title um, claim area map on the left. But on the right is, um, in orange, is um, Deuteroa country. And the red is the um, Vic Forest Allocation Order. So you can see that quite a substantial amount falls in our, our traditional country. So as traditional owners that are not formally recognised, we're not going to be the first point of call for government to come to us. So what we need is from people that are here today, you know, to tell the story of these people that are really quite professional. They can get their crap together, you know. We can um, manage programs. We, we I, I recently was um, looking, I was on the Ovens River and I was looking at the, the replanting that they've been doing you know, around the riparian area. And the young man from uh, Nekma, I think, was explaining, you know, all of this stuff and he's like an expert in the area and he was, he was great. You know, he had some wonderful things to say. But for me, all I could think of was, oh, my God, he knows all of this knowledge about my country. I never got that opportunity. And I couldn't help but feel this angst and this hurt inside that our people just haven't had that opportunity. And it's so unjust and we need to really fight for this. So we need people um, that, you know, people that are here today, people that are online watching. We need those allies to, you know, help ring our cause. And especially after the, um, the referendum, like for us, I think we kind of knew that it was going to be a no because we know now how, well, we knew then before how much racism still exists, especially in regional areas. We knew that it would be a problem. We knew the referendum would be a problem, period. We knew that being a no would be worse than being a yes. And how that's manifested as being worse is because in regional areas where you've got the, the no vote at 67% or 53.9%, um, local regional newspapers are advertising that and celebrating the no vote. And what that's doing is diminishing the confidence of the people, our people that are on the ground on country. It's pr particularly prevalent up in the northwest. Um, and, it, and it's heartbreaking to see our people. So you know, we work, I, I work as a researcher at a university, and so this is my side gig, you know, doing all of this stuff. I, I think I've managed six different funding rounds recently. I've been travelling since July, um, partially for my work and partially, mostly for doing all of this stuff that I do for my communities. So we're, we're kind of limited on the, on the ground. I mean, if you think about the population, we're 2.7% of the population. So the people that are doing the work that I'm doing are even less. So this is the kind of um, support that we want to um, ask for to help our people get more engaged, get more skills um, and, and, and put your hand up and say, well, you know, what can we do to help you? How can we help? Because that's really what we want. You know, we've got the people, they've got the skills, they just don't have the qualifications. They know it all because they've lived on country, they've survived. And we will continue to survive. Andrew said before that his organisation is 12, 13 years old, young. We've been here a bit longer. Um, you can say 40,000, you can say 80,000, you can say 120,000 and there's evidence that points to all of those, those um, numbers. But the reality is that we were here first. It is our country and we want to be able to manage it. Thank you.